If you have fear, you almost have to ignore it and remember why you're doing what you're doing in the first place. And that's really about enjoyment, you know. And fear is going to just wipe that, all that enjoyment out if you let it stay involved, if you let it take over. Great to have you here. I, I must tell you something that I have interviewed many musicians at all different levels for this series. When your name comes up, the level of respect and admiration that people have with you, and the fun that they have in playing with you, and not only musically fun, but just the hang with you is fun. I mean, it really is a, a great testimony to, to who you are as a person, as a player. I pay them handsomely. <laughs> I hope to get on that list someday. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're on. So this is really about, about trying to find out what, what motivates you and where it all came from because you, know, you are really a force in music it's worldwide, but really in the energy of New York scene here, what we're doing here. So where did music first start with you? What, when did it first hit you? And I believe drumming might have been your first step into the It absolutely was. I, w I was lucky enough to grow up in a household of jazz parents, jazz mm -hmm. musician parents who loved not only listening to a lot of stuff, but playing. They, they, my father was a player, my mom was a singer, a la Sarah Vaughan, kind of in that oh, nice. style. Nice, nice. If they weren't playing, they were, they were playing records. So I got an early sense of what groove was. Mm. And that's kind of the underlying thing that kind of sits at the bottom of everything I do yeah. musically. All the kinds of music that I like the most are kind of groove-based. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of know in my body what a really good groove is supposed to feel like. And if it's not feeling like that, I get really uncomfortable. You know? <laughs> good for you. Yeah. So drums, you, saw, you heard the Beatles. And that, that influenced many of us at that time in 1964, Huge. February. Huge, the biggest. What an impact, right? Just talk about that, that what that meant. For well, you. that was a, a moment in time where there was popular music. Yeah. And popular music was going along at a pretty sing-songy pace, you know, and songs were like coming out of the, the radio and they were all, you know, nicely written pieces of music yeah. and they were all in this particular style, whatever that is. There was a couple of different styles going on at the time. But the Beatles, who thought they were kind of interpreting American-influenced yeah. versions of, of their own original stuff, which when we heard it, it sounded like it was coming from outer space. We did didn't realize that they were doing their version of our music in a way. Yeah. You know, and, but, and when I say our music, the music that they were focused on that was coming out of America, of America was the stuff that we weren't even really allowed to hear because radio stations weren't necessarily playing it. Yeah. And I'm talking about R&B and yeah. soul and, yeah. you know, yeah. even race music, if you want to call it that yeah. at the time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, at that time. And the great blues stuff that wasn't getting airplay necessarily, but it was, it was around and it was being recorded, but it wasn't pop music. And, you know, this is in an era where there were, you know, three television stations, one or two local stations in each town, you know. Mm. There wasn't Sirius and there wasn't in yeah. internet radio and there wasn't a source of 24-hour music of your choice playing. So they would choose for you. And yeah. what they chose wasn't necessarily the stuff that, that was the best stuff, right? you know. Right. My first... Uh, hearing of them was, was uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand came on the radio. And I didn't know what was happening. I just thought, <laughs> can I hear that again? You know, and I would sit around waiting for them to play it again because you'd had to wait. And it wasn't in the stores yet. So when I finally was able to buy the first Beatle album, which was called Meet the Beatles in our country, with the Beatles in, in England it was called, yeah. I just kept listening to every track like, over and over and over and over again. And by the time they hit the Ed Sullivan show, which was a Sunday night program where everybody gathered around their TV sets at seven o'clock at night to watch this black and white show, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I was so ready for it that I wouldn't let anybody else in my family near the TV screen. I just said, I got this, this is, all, <laughs> this is mine. I want every pixel of this right here, you know? Because you couldn't see close-ups of guys doing their craft, you know, the way, yeah. you, the way they would zoom in on Ringo and, oh, that's how he's doing it. Yeah. Because at that point, I had already owned a drum kit. Uh, my father had given it to me years before, but I never was really motivated to go and play it because I didn't really have any goal. You know, what am I going to... It's, it's great there's a drum kit here. Yeah. Okay, I, you know, drums are drums and whatever. And yeah, what do you do? I don't know. I mean, what's my motivation? What am I trying to... I didn't really have a hero, if you will. 
So those that that show gave you the goals that you needed to. It did. I knew exactly you. what I wanted to do with my time after that. You see guys playing their ass off. It's great, and then you see girls reacting like going. They're going crazy it's watching crazy. you do it. Yeah. And I was 11. Yeah. And I was at an age where, yeah, I'd like to have somebody take notice of me. That'd be nice, <laughs> you know. Let me see if uh, music is the answer, <laughs> you know. So of course. As soon as the TV show went off, I was right into the other room bashing away at the drums from, from that day until today. And then you kind of got involved in the school band. Was it French horn that you started playing? I was playing trumpet from junior high school through high school and toward the end of high school. My uh, high school band director asked me if I would switch over to, to French horn for some strange reason. Yeah. You know? I was doing okay with the trumpet. Yeah. I wasn't a, an improviser, but I could read and I had a Decent range, okay. not great, yeah. but I was always able to contribute to the band that I was in, whether it was marching band or concert band. Yeah. And I said, sure, you know, whatever. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't inspiring to be Miles <laughs> Davis, you know. So I just said, what the hell, you know. So I went to the French horn thing where you played a lot of umpas in the marching band and yeah. impossible figures in the concert band. <laughs> and by the time high school ended, that was my instrument, sort of. So when I got into college, it seemed logical to me that that should be my, my, my major because that's kind of where I was at when we last checked in with uh, Will and his, his instrument life. <laughs> and you had no ideas of what you would do with that French horn or was it you just... Nah, just, you know, part of a thing, whatever, that's cool, you know. <laughs> and that's when I realized I, how bad I really sucked. <laughs> when I got around some real players, you know that were actually majors in that instrument. Yeah. <laughs> Humbling, to say the least. <laughs> and I did the world a favor because uh, I got off that instrument. <laughs> One of the luckiest breaks that I had ever was, uh, <clears throat> I was failing miserably in, in school, which was embarrassing because my father was the dean of the University of Miami Music School. My grades, <laughs> my grades were grades you probably never heard of. <clears throat> W's. You ever heard of it? Do you ever get a W? No. That's withdrawn. <laughs> I, I think, is incomplete. And, and everybody's favorite F, as in French horn. I was really doing really poorly. I was playing six sets a night, six nights a week, uh, at a club playing bass every night until four in the morning. And I would get up for my eight o'clock theory class. And I would flunk misery, I would fall asleep <laughs> all day long. And I had a whole plethora of, of subjects that I wasn't interested in. History, English, you know, all the stuff you thought you were supposed to have to take. Yeah, but yeah. this guy, the assistant dean, my father couldn't do this because it's too nepotism-like for him to save me in college. So the assistant dean sat me down and said, look, you're blowing it, man. And I've heard you play bass. Why don't you choose bass as your major? And it never occurred to me because that hadn't happened yet. It was too new of an instrument. Yeah, you know, people were doing, were playing upright bass as their major. But you were playing Bowie, electric bass, and I, my instrument was electric bass. Yeah. You know, so I thought, wow, you can do that. <laughs> and he actually sat down with me with a piece of manuscript paper and a pencil, and on the spot taught me the name, the note names of the bass clef staff by putting a dot here. And I would think about it for a minute and I would name the, the note. You would put another dot somewhere else, whether it was a space or a line, and I would say, G. Oh, oh, the last one was a G too. I'm, so, I'm starting to get the pattern, you know? Interesting. And next thing you know, I was, I was like in bass clef mode due to a really simple exercise. Because I, I had already been able to read rhythms yeah. because of the French horn and trumpet years. Yeah. So I had that down. So it was a natural transition. And the other thing is I got a, an instructional book by Carol Kay, who had great instructional books out. Mm. And, they, and in, inside one of the books was a transcription of the bass line of I Was Made to Love Her, Stevie Wonder. Put the record on and I'm watching the bass line go by and I'm going, wow, that's what that figure looks like. Mm. That's incredible. There was a lot of ga ga gas in there. A lot of 16th, 8th, 16ths and tied together and those kind of things. Yeah. And as I'm reading along and listening along, I'm seeing every time it sounds like that, it looks like that. Hmm. And that never changes. So once you got the, get the rhythms down, you know, you can always sort of like 
they'll keep coming back and, and back and back and back. Right. And there'll always be something you can count on. You know, if you're reading, if you're into reading music, many, right. pe many people don't care about reading music. The Beatles didn't read music. Yeah, but yeah, I yeah. like reading music because yeah. I can walk into a situation and be with another bunch of people that also know how to read. Or if I don't know the song and they do, and somebody gives me a chart for it, I'm instantly in much, the song with everybody much else. Faster you're involved. Yeah, yeah, you're involved. Yeah, faster. instant, instant music. Yeah, yeah. No learning, you know, no waiting around for a guy to figure out his part, and you know. Yeah, yeah. So I love that about about a language that that people can use to to transfer musical ideas. It's called yeah. reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you, you take this now, so you start to learn the bass, you're starting to get more confident with it. Are you listening to any specific bass players at that time? Of course I was listening to all the popular music that was happening in Paul McCartney and, right. and Motown, right. mostly. Right. And the Rascals and Steve Miller Band and Stevie Wonder. And, right. you know. The jazz band director at the time, when I first got over onto bass and invited me to be in the, in the A big band at the University of Miami, pretty, that happened all, all happened really fast. Hmm. He turned me on to Monk Montgomery. Monk Montgomery was the brother of Wes Montgomery, who yeah. was putting out albums, jazz albums, on electric bass. Nobody else was doing this. He was the pioneer, the ultimate, you know, the first guy to like take the big plunge. I had a fancy for upright, the sound of upright, but I didn't want to play upright or carry upright <laughs> or, or have fretlessness in my life at the time. <laughs> I liked good pitch, yeah. and I was a big fan of that. And I was also beginning to read, so you, you know, the idea of not being able to look at the bass and the music at the same time was not really an option. If you're going to read some music, you kind of wanted your hands to, to, to be sort of on their own while you're looking at the music so you know where to go next musically. Right. So my taste uh, always sort of leads me towards shorter notes because since I grew up listening to upright bass, my favorite bass sound is the thumpiest thing you can imagine. <laughs> it doesn't have a lot of clack and slang to it. It's, it's kind of more like, like the sound of a car going by with that big beefed up bass system in it. <laughs> That's my favorite bass sound, is <laughs> that really masked sound. Yeah. And I think part of the reason bass appeals to me is you can sort of hide. You know, what if you don't play the right note? <laughs> Who's going to check? Play faster and they'll never be over the note, you know? It's true, though. I do like a really thuddy bass. Interesting. You know, it's, it doesn't translate well on an iPhone uh, pinhole speaker, <laughs> but it's, it's still my favorite thing to hear live. It's like that sort of Rocco Tower of Power thing. I developed yeah. a, a technique at the same time he did. No, I didn't before I even knew about him, yeah. but it has everything to do with muting with the left hand as opposed to the right hand palm mute, which a lot of bass players have incorporated. Right. There's a thing, you know, where you're like, you're playing the note with one finger and you're muting it with the, all the other three. So you get the super thud. You yeah. Know? And I can play some ridiculously fast stuff like, like by moving my entire hand instead of articulating every note from string to string like this. Interesting. And I only do it because my body reacts to what my ears want to hear. So my hand will jerk around all over that instrument to, to please my own ear if you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. But what a great way to, to, to find your own sound and style in there is that you just trusted your instinct of what you felt better than as opposed to articulating your fingers, you went with this full arm motion. Yeah, and I have no, hmm. no technique to speak of. It's just, it's just wherever my hand will go to make the sound that I want to hear back, you know. I love and, your humility. No, <laughs> it's but true, but honestly. You, and it, but you play, when you play, you, you have great technique in your sound and how you play. Well, what I, I guess the thing that I'm thinking about even more than anything else is, it, we're not, not to get too off the subject, but when I play with a pick, I developed a technique that allowed me to, again, satisfy my own ears, but it's totally not economical in any way, shape, or form. It's, like, it's one of these things where every, up, every stroke is an upstroke, Right. So, and I've found that I can, you know, it's, as uneconomical as that is, I can play really fast that way because I have no technique that allows me to go back and forth from string to string. I, I never learned how to do mm. that. And I was thrown into the fire when I got into studio work in New York City because you'd have to, in the course of a day, play like 19 different styles of music, right? right, you'd, right. Have to, you'd be called on to play with a pick with your fingers or like Larry Graham style yeah. with your thumb. Yeah. Among those three techniques, you know, you'd be going back and forth through, through from from like 
say you're doing a, a, a bunch of commercials for like name a product, any, whatever, any kind of like food, food or whatever, or food, yeah. and they wanted to sell it to different audiences. So right. they would be marketing specifically to, to down south in the country, you know, where country fans live, wherever that is. Yeah. They would market it to to black they audiences. That feel. Yeah. They would market to you know just you know, would, you know something that would be during a commercial during the Hallmark hour or something yeah, and so yeah. it's super ultra clean and pristine, you know. Yeah. So you'd have to have all these techniques down. And I kind of worked on basically just satisfying not only the arranger but my own ears. So I would come up with these goofball techniques that would that would get me there. <laughs> like in a flash. Because there's no there's no time wasting in the studio. Yeah. You know. Studio time was really costly. Still is, yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah, yeah so, you yeah, know, yeah. so I just developed these goofball, bastardized versions of techniques just to make the sound. So you resolved the challenge immediately in, at the moment for whatever you needed to make it happen. You, you'd find a way. Sure. That's pretty creative in the moment because the pressure and... It's fun, it, though. It, it, well, it, it, it is fun, but, I mean, you see it as fun. Some people see it as pressure, and pressure shuts them down. The opposite worked for you. Under that pressure, you opened up. You know why? <laughs> I was under pressure and I was nervous, mm -hmm. but I was also thinking long term. Mm -hmm. And I was also remembering how lucky I was to be a studio musician at that time because I couldn't believe every, every day I walked into several different musical scenarios, a new piece of music that you'd never have to think about again, ever. Yeah. One after the other, a new band. Every time you walked into the studio, there would yeah. be a new group of people. Yeah. And sometimes it would be three people. Like, it would be piano, bass, and drums. Sometimes it would be... One time, I, a couple of times, I was just, just bass. Like, for Tidy Bowl. <laughs> there, was a, there was the Tidy Bowl commercial <laughs> where the guy was... The Tidy Bowl man was inside of a toilet tank in a boat. And somehow... It, the whole thing was a bass solo. I don't remember why. I think he had an upright bass in his boat or something. Like, who doesn't? That's normal, right? Open up your toilet tank. There's a guy in blue liquid with a... Anyway. Or, or you'd walk into it. would be a full orchestra yeah. with the entire string section. Like, many, many other upright bass players. There'd be plenty of cello and, and, and lots of violas and violins and, you know, flutes and French horns and blah, blah, blah. And there you'd be... And you can't screw that up. You, so you had an incredible amount of wide variety of situations that you came into that you had to have that musical background. So if they asked for something, you had to have some reference musically. Totally. To and luckily I had enough. I had yeah. enough of that to, to, to fake it until reggae came along. <laughs> and I was stumped. When reggae came along... You know, I thought of myself as a guy who could who could really come in with and and make up an authentic part that had something to do with the genre I was in. Yeah. When reggae came along, all bets were off. <laughs> I was I was toast. The only way I could fake a reggae part because when I heard that stuff, I thought, man, what planet is this music from? Yeah, I didn't yeah. understand. I just thought that did the bass player not know the chord changes, and that's why he hit the note after everybody else did. <laughs> The only way I could come up with an authentic bass part, and I hated to do this, but I would actually go back and refer to an actual, like, Whalers record so I could see what... i try to find a similar tempoed piece of music by those guys, because to me, they were the, the architects, and as far as my taste is concerned, they're the ultimate version of what reggae right. is. I think they are the absolute top of the food chain, yeah, the, yeah. The, the Barrett brothers. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So I would actually go back and try to like basically steal a lick until I finally sort of f felt it in my body and now I can like fake it. But I would really go back and like, I can't come up with anything. I got to go listen to some whalers to get the information. And I hate doing that. Yeah. I really don't like to do um, derivative stuff ever. If I'm as a songwriter, I don't want to start listening to somebody's song and go write a song. Right, right. You know, right, I hate right. I just don't want to do that. I want to be a little bit more pure about it. But you had to do the research. You had to do the research it, to understand it. In that case, yeah, because yeah, yeah. I really was stumped. Yeah, I, was, yeah. I was at a loss. Everything I sounded, everything I made up sounded silly. It didn't sound authentic at all. <laughs> and how and much, I hated that. How much reggae did you end up playing in the course of your time? A good amount. Yeah? Yeah, because, you know, when it came into, into you know, 
sort of the pop world, there'd be a lot of reggae situations yeah, where you'd, yeah. you know, you'd need to, to play something authentic. So what happened now, when did you meet up with, with Paul Schaefer? Did you meet up with him first as far as with the, uh, the World's was, Most Dangerous Band? Was it around that time? Years before the, the World's Most Dangerous Band, it was before Saturday Night Live, mm -hmm. which started in 75 right. with Paul in the band. Right. And I was actually asked to do that band, but I, I was working so much on weekends that I couldn't commit, so I just said no. Hmm. Back at, at the time that this happened, I'd already been on a few Barry Manilow records and some of his big hits and stuff like Mandy and those things. Nice. So Paul Schaefer uh, knew of my playing, and he also was hip to the fact that Ron Dante was the producer of, of, uh, of Barry Manilow, of those, of those records we were doing. And he had an artist that he was working with named Paul Jabara. Paul Schaefer and Paul Jabara, and Paul Jabara was actually using Paul as an arranger. They eventually ended up co-writing together and, and wrote It's Raining Men together. Hmm. But Paul Schaefer came in as the arranger and pianist for this guy, Paul Jabara, and had gotten um, Ron Dante to be the producer of this session. So Ron Dante basically called his guys, which was me and whoever else, you know, they could get on drums that day and, you know, the, the regular guitar player that would do those gigs. Yeah. You know, they, would, they would move that around between guys, but whoever was available for that one. And Paul Schaefer and I just got along like gangbusters from the minute we met. You know, we, there was such a mutual respect. I loved the guy and yeah. I still love him to death. Yeah. I still, I, he's one of my best, my favorite people on the planet. Yeah. You know, just a great, great guy. A brilliant talent too. I mean, he just knows yeah, too crazy. A wide variety of knowledge that he has. It's amazing has a, a real good awareness of the room, yeah. of what's happening in the room. Yeah, yeah. Very smart guy, yeah. you know, and funny, you know. <laughs> so uh, that was our first meeting, and we did a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So we had done various, ma some Manilow records, and we also flew out to L.A., did a Cher album together. He, he's a great session player, really one of the best. Really? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's funny, people don't... Think of him as yeah, like yeah. the guy that, they think of him as the guy with the personality and stuff, but in, he's money in the bank in the studio. And I say it all the time, like, you know, I, I, I don't know if he wants to, people to know this or if he wants to turn <laughs> down stuff, but I'm going to give him the chance to make his, that decision on his own by, keep, by telling everybody that he's the greatest in the yeah. studio. So at this point, are, are you, you're starting to work more now. How are you organizing your business part of it? You know, a lot of the young kids that watch this here, don't know how the business skills, what business skills are needed to maintain I have none of that. <laughs> I have nothing. I got an accountant. All right. And as soon as I had any doubts about that accountant, I would go to the next accountant. <laughs> <laughs> and I would feel comfortable there for a while until I found out, oh, they're robbing me. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Well, got to go to the next accountant then. So you look, you know, you ask for recommendations, and people are happy with their people, and you know that's how you end up with you evolve with kind of the right people. I mean, sometimes there's there's a business manager involved too. You can you can actually find people that do both. I just recently spoke to Steve Gadney. He had mentioned that he had worked with this. Steve, with, who? Steve, yeah, right, a local drummer. That name here in sounds New York. so familiar to me somehow. <laughs> and he, he talked about the the Japanese piano player that you guys had worked with recently. Oh, uh, we just came back from uh, touring with Aiku Abara. Yeah. She's fantastic, yeah. 25 years old, huge vocabulary, can what a, do anything. What a talent. Writes great. Yeah, she's amazing. She's really cool. It's interesting. I get also travel uh, every year to Japan with the great Akiko Yano, mm -hmm. with Chris Parker on drums. The yeah, three of yeah. us have a trio that we go and tour with, and she's an, a, a person who's just got, like, she knows everything about music. She knows everything about... She's taught me so much about American music. Really? Yeah, she's just hip to everything, and she and she's one of these people who's got great jazz chops, and she can sing really well. She's got a unique sound. But the thing that Steve and I did, uh, we just did a live album, and you know Steve, man, I mean, he just turns everything into great music. Yeah, you know, yeah. he always picks the right stuff, and he slaved every day. There was one new song that she had written just for that tour, and the form wasn't sitting right with Steve. So Steve would pull out last night's recording of, of the sets, and, we, and, and we'd put the phones on, on and analyze this thing over and over again from the live recordings, both sets from the night before. Yeah. And we would just keep tweaking away at it until we had something that, that seemed like it was presentable enough to be on this new live album that we just recorded. But it took a lot of, 
doing to get there. And Steve was so diligent. It seems like you also have that, that perseverance yeah. that you want to get it right. So you'll do whatever it takes to get it right. It's a thin line between insulting people <laughs> and uh, wishing it, you know, it, you got to pick your battles. You yeah. Know? yeah. I'm all about wanting it to sound good, but it was Steve Gadd himself who blew my mind like decades ago when he said this one statement that, you know, that you can't imagine like a, a guy who's, who's like a musical genius stating, but he, and he doesn't remember saying this, but, but one time we were, we were together and he, and we were talking about this and that, and I, it was at a time when I was so focused on getting the music right and just, you know, what do you got to do? And you got to like, be perfectly in tune, you gotta like bring your instrument and new strings and great <laughs> stuff and have to know what you're doing, listen to music every every five minutes in between. And he said this statement that, that blew me away because I was so singular, singularly focused on getting the music right. He said, people are more important than music. And he stopped me in my tracks mm. with, with that statement, yeah. you know? And if you know Steve Gadd, you can see Absolutely. That that is the case Absolutely. for him and really for everybody else, yeah. whether they know it or not. Yeah, yeah. Because music is, has no value without people, first of all. Yeah. Who gives a damn, yeah, you know? Yeah. What are you saying with the music? Are you entertaining me? Are you making me feel good? Are you making me feel anything? Yeah. You know? So it really is about people. You know, that's it. Yeah. And, so, and his feeling, his feeling, his, his, I use the word. Hey, I thought okay. we were talking about me. No, <laughs> well, <go> his feeling <laughs> of compassion is so deep. But I, I, I say the fact that every time I've seen you perform, listen, you are the same way. You, when you're performing on stage and I see you, you are so aware of how other people feel that, uh, you know, that you really want to make sure it's right for everyone on that stage. Because if it's right for everyone on that stage, you know you're going to reach the audience. I've been doing a lot of musical directing lately for a lot of different projects. Yeah. And one of which is the is um, Little Kids Rock, which I love. Yeah. And one is, you know, there's a lot of things. There's a, a, a great thing that we do every year for God's Love We Deliver. We call it Love Rocks NYC, which is a huge undertaking. Yeah. There's a festival coming up in Japan next year for the first time that's going to be really interesting to deal with a lot of Japanese and a lot of American musicians working together, which has been a dream of mine since forever. Fantastic. And there's another thing I, I do every year, every other year, for uh, uh, to raise money for the disease that killed Mike Brecker, called MDS. Mm. And it's a really also great jazz, more much more jazz centric right. fundraiser. But in doing these things, there are tons of personalities, and I'm not talking about just the artists. I'm right. talking about the representation as well. Yeah. So you got to get through. You know, you just got to keep your eye on the prize. And to me, the prize is the music. Yeah. And, and I also, as I, as I said before, I think long term. And I always have about, about you know, am I going to let fear overtake me in this moment? And if I do, what's that going to do for the music? What's that going to do for the future of this project that keeps coming up year after year? If you have fear, you almost have to ignore it. And remember why you're doing what you're doing in the first place. And that's really about enjoyment, you know. Mm -hmm. And fear is going to just wipe that all that enjoyment out if you let it stay involved, if you let it take over. So for these projects, you know, I think I might have gotten a little bit of this from Arif Marden from doing, you know, as many albums as I did with him. I think maybe 26 wow. albums over time. And I saw how he operated. And he never let anything get in the way of him getting to the ultimate goal, which was a great piece of music, you know. He kept his eye on the prize constantly. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't shaken by divas mentalities or personalities or anybody's like being late or, or guys like me having the Letterman show where I couldn't schedule at the exact hours that he wanted me to. So he would actually work around that for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, he eventually lost patience for that. But you, know, <laughs> you got to get the music done. Yeah. You know, you can't yeah. just wait and wait and wait yeah. Yeah. for anybody. And if there's a project and there's money and there's record companies and all that stuff. Yeah. But, you know, in these situations, it's really just about like, okay, say, say it's a fundraiser, like we're doing a fundraiser. And that means you want to have people in the audience who aren't necessarily even music fans. 
Right. They were just people who were coming to lend their money right. and donate their money to the cause. Right. And as long as they're going to be there, you might as well make their experience of lending the money to the cause as enjoyable as possible. You don't want to go over their heads. Yeah. And even if it's music they weren't familiar with, you would want it to make it something that they would want to pay money again to go here right. next time. Because right. like the first time I heard the Beatles, I didn't know what it was. I wasn't even sure if I liked it yet. Hmm. It was that uh, different. Hmm. And not only did I, did I end up liking it, you know, I ended up making it a, a way of life, mm. you know, just because I hung in, because it, it had my curiosity, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. And it's funny, I, I was growing up in Texas, at one point I had a girlfriend that said, is it me or the Beatles? <laughs> well, <laughs> nice talking to you. <laughs> I guess, uh, and I'm glad my investment paid off. <laughs> I'm glad I was right, you know. <laughs> Because uh, it ended up being like just watching the Beatles grow the yeah, whole time yeah. and getting it right over and over again. Every yeah. time they took a chance, they, wouldn't, they would ignore the last bit of success they had, the last hit they had. I'm sure the record company was calling up and saying, let's do that again. That yeah, was great, yeah. fellas. Yeah, and they were like, nope, we got something more to, to offer. And they went 180 to a whole and different... And they would take yeah. a chance and get it right every time, yeah, yeah, over and over again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How cocky is that? Well, How it, confident. But you know something, you, 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 you show that obviously your passion for music was that strong, that you were that focused, and you had your eye on that prize of what you wanted to achieve in that. I guess. I mean, yeah. I do have to say that no matter what kind of music I've ever done, what style it was, or whatever I was called upon to do, I would, there would always be a big thread running through my whole like, approach, thinking, what would the Beatles have done here? Yeah. You know, when I was at an absolute loss is what to play, what part to bring in. And I've said it over and over again. As a, as a bass player, I want to be the Ringo of bass players. <laughs> That's what I want to be because yeah. he was the ultimate drummer that, you know, the ultimate dream drummer for a songwriter to have yeah, come in yeah. and participate on, on their, their piece of music because look what he did. And look what he didn't do. At, what he didn't do was probably even more powerful. The space. But when that it he was put, needed though, right? He did, yeah. He, he did. brought in. <laughs> With the swing and the swagger, yeah, yeah, you know, that's what I want to be on bass. I want to be Ringo. <laughs> How powerful that is! And he had a—he was a lefty playing a righty kit. So the awkwardness of that, you know, as a young drummer trying to figure him out, we'd hear some of the fills. But he started with his left hand, and we had to kind of calculate our movement. It was really brilliant. What do you I expect love. out of a drummer when you hear them? When, you know, in playing bass, knowing that you play drums and you have it—is there anything that you look for to define? what you want out of that drummer? I just want him to have an approach because whatever approach he has is going to guide pretty much everything else. Mm. So, and, and to trust that approach. If he, if, if he has the, the amount of, enough taste to bring like a stance, say. Yeah. If he has enough of an attitude, enough of a, of a sure feeling about what it should be, one of the things that, uh, another, let's get back to Steve Gadd for one second, and then we'll, <laughs> sure. and then we'll get back to reality. Sure. <laughs> because Steve showed me one time a thing that, you know, my tendency was always to, okay, you sit down in the studio, put the, somebody puts a piece of music in front of you and hit the button and the red light goes on and you just start doing something. Yeah. Steve had the opposite approach. He wanted to go into the control room. Can you play me the piece of music first so I can hear what it is we're talking about? Yeah. If there was any example of it already demoed, which quite often there was, you know, yeah. know what the song is trying to say first before we start bashing away at it. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Steve always would even like to find out what the what the words and the storyline behind it were. He sometimes he totally, dig, he, but that's an interesting approach on how on how he approaches it and how he succeeds out of it every time. Yeah, he plays for the song totally, and that's what you do, right? Yeah. That's the Ringo thing. Yeah. But that's really, you do that. You serve the song every time. There are many times that I've I look you play. For it. I try to find All the time. It. And on the TV show where you're doing it every night, you, you guys, you know, found that song, you got right into the core of it, and you hit it, and you played it, and you did it, and you did the, and it was magic every night. It really was. I'm not sure it was difficult every night, but you made it work every night. It made me realize later, after it was all over, that we were probably the most visible cover band ever in, Absolutely. in life. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> because totally. that's basically what it was. It was totally. just a cover band. But, but you played them, it's interesting, because I used to watch, because I'd say you played it 
authentic to the song, but your personalities were in the song, which was really kind of kind of. That cool. was Paul Schaefer. That yeah. was him allowing us to have fun with it. Once we kind of knew it, he would. He never. He almost never. I can't even think if he ever gave me any direction. Yeah. Ever. He always trusted me to come up with the right thing. Even even on his song, which was the theme. Yeah. I don't think there are two performances that are ever the same right. from the bass end of things. Yeah. Because I always just had fun with it. You know, I always just wanted to to see what I could do with it. You know, without like changing it. Yeah. But, but just like keep it keep it kind of gravitating and gr moving along and growing <laughs> and doing going somewhere over the years. So there's all these weird little variations on that on the theme, literally. So yeah. Beautiful. But you know, the the trust has to be earned. And once that trust is earned, and it was evident in how you guys played, it was there, and that's that, there's a there's a beauty to that 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 yeah trust there, there is, was a mutual yeah that's a thing that's a beautiful with us that, that's a beautiful quality to have in in life and of course in music in the process you know these young kids that watch this and and, and and hopefully these generations that hear your words and what you're saying and, and and this is wisdom of life experience that you put together that you have been dragged through the coals at, at times you know squeezing it for that diamond you know you had to research for it what would you say to that next generation in in closing will to, to to give them some kind of a guidance to achieve their dreams and their hope in the music industry i would just say you know if you can afford to follow your heart all the way hmm. and trust it because the heart is always right it may f make you even feel uncomfortable at times to, to follow it. Hmm. But you really should follow it because that's where the truth lives, you know, for you. It would be great if everybody in the world was a performance major. Hmm. But the world, what the world really needs is somebody more following their actual heart than, than having stars in their eyes. Yeah. Well, if anyone is ever a great example of that, it is you at what you do consistently with, the, with the, the process of how you play music, how you live music, and how you guide other musicians in a direction that when you perform, you make everyone feel good. And that's the deep compassion that you feel that you eventually, literally, allow the audience to feel also. That's Thank a pretty you. powerful combination. Thank you. I'm a, I'm a terrible plumber and a lousy insurance salesman, by the way. <laughs> I really don't have much of a choice. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.